Now, Eyewitness Sports. Welcome to the latest episode of Double OT with Mark Dondero. Now our second show, still no child. We're squeezing what, one in here before the baby comes. What's the latest? My wife had to be induced. We're waiting. Uh, we're just waiting for the process to really <laughs> ramp up. So her due date was what, last week? Last, last week? Wednesday, yeah. She must be ready to rock. She's ready to rock and roll. She's uncomfortable. She is ready to go. And you got the playoff beard going. Yep, ready, ready to go. I hope you don't shave that until you come back. We'll see. All right, let's get rolling here. Uh, as we are on the uh, doorstep of NBA and NHL playoffs, the Celtics are going to get in, possibly as the one seed. The Bruins are right there. At the end of the day, the fan bases, who is the more satisfied fan base, Bruin fan or Celtic fan when we talk in May or June? I think this is a tough question because the expectations for both teams are different. You know, the right. Bruins, they're just trying to get into the playoffs, let alone win the championship. The Celtics, we don't really think, check that, we don't think they're going to win the championship, but... Eastern Conference Finals, is that the expectation? At the end of the day, I'm going to say the Celtics fan will be more satisfied mm -hmm. come June 15th or whatever because I think the Celtics, based on how the NBA is, they have a better chance to get into the playoffs, to make a run, to win some games. Now, we haven't seen it out of them, and I don't have a lot of confidence in what mm -hmm. I'm saying. But for now, I'll say the Celtics fans have a better chance of being more satisfied, mainly because, and we're going to talk about it later, the Bruins' goaltending situation. I don't feel good about where we're at right now as far as the Bruins and their goalie. So with that kind of up in the air, at least right now, we'll see what happens this week. Um, I'm going to say it's the, Bru it's the Celtics fans who will be more satisfied, but I haven't discounted the Bruins being able to do something because I do have some confidence in Bruce Cassidy. The thing about the Stanley Cup playoffs is that once the Bruins get in, they could make a run, could, at which yep. point the fan base could be more satisfied because they're not expecting much at this point with how they've been playing. But because the Celtics have done jack squat in the playoffs, getting in and being swept the last two years, they have so much more upside that if they win the first series, are you content? Probably not. But I think they win that first series. And if they win two, I think you're satisfied. I don't think anyone thinks they're going to beat Cleveland in the Eastern Conference Finals at this point. But because the bar has been set so low in terms of playoff accomplishments, I think Celtic fan at the end of the season will say, hey, we got the number one or two seed. We won two series. What's going to happen this offseason? Do we add another piece? And we're kind of good to go here into the future. So I'm going to say Celtics at the end of the day. Listen, if the Bruins miss the playoffs for three years in a row, that is a bad, bad oh, look. Yeah. And we I don't know if, I don't know if does Cassidy keep his job? Do they move Char? Do they move Tuca? Th that's a the conversation for a separate show. But what, real quick, what is the Bruins' expectation? What, what would make the fans of the Bruins satisfied, do you think? Uh, I one guess, series I, win? I, You'd have to say that, right? Yeah, if they, getting based in, in on at the, least one series and competitive in another. That would be satisfying, I would yeah. say, yeah. Okay. So. so we'll have to wait and see. We'll get back to the Bruins momentarily here. But first, the Red Sox. It's been sort of a sleepy spring training. I don't know if the World Baseball Classic kind of overshadowed the baseball's people, their view of spring training and what we've been paying attention to, maybe a little bit. But coming out of spring training as we're, what, what is it, a week away from? A week from today, opening, opening day. day. Fenway yeah. Park. Um, well, the, they don't open at Fenway, right? They do. They do open at Fenway. Okay, so what is the most interesting Red Sox storyline to you as we approach opening day. Mine is the dynamic between the top three starters. You have David Price, who's hurt and probably not pitching till, I don't know, May, June. You have Chris Sale, who's looked awesome this spring training. A bona fide ace that they've acquired. Someone who can probably lead this rotation. And then you have Rick Porcello coming off the Cy Young Award season. Is that a splash in the pan or is he going to maintain the level that he was pitching at last year? So I think there's so many questions with the three so-called aces. And at the end of the day, I think Sale will become the front runner in that rotation. We don't know about Price's health. And then if, if Porcello can give you 80% of what he did last year, do I think he's going to win 22 games again? No. But if he can give you 17 or 18, a bunch of innings, and keep that ERA down, I think you're happy with it. So I think the dynamic between those three fascinates me. If you asked me this question in September, that would be my answer going into the playoffs. I'm mildly interested in what Rick Porcello can do coming off of the Cy Young mm -hmm. year. But... It's the regular season. We said. David Price had a good regular season last year. You know, we've seen right. him have good regular So I don't really care. You know, I want to see how he is in the playoffs. Sure, I'm interested in Chris Sale. You know, you expect it just for watching him. Right. Uh, to watch him will be fun. But yeah. my answer is Pablo Sandoval. Listen, the MVP of the Grapefruit League, essentially. <laughs> He's leading the spring 
uh, leading the league this spring in, in RBIs, I believe. Wow. I thought I read that, 19 RBIs or something like that. A couple home runs. He's the Barkidius Mingo of not, spring training. Not great against lefties. At last check, he was one for eight, and they're playing, uh, I think, as we tape this show. So I'm not sure where that number went. But I think, you know, based on his resume from San Francisco and what he's been able to do in Boston so far, which is nothing, essentially. Nothing, A 240 yeah. average, whatever it was, and then he got hurt. I want to see, can this guy contribute? Because this guy, was a, he's been an all-star. He's been a World Series hero. Can he contribute? And with David Ortiz being gone, you could use some, dare I say, thump, but you could use a good lefty bat. You know, it, it, we'll see if he can hit lefties, but you could use that guy in the lineup. And the good thing about the Sandoval situation is you're expecting so little that whatever he gives you is a plus. It's almost like acquiring another free agent because he was nothing to your team last year. So anything he gives you is just a bonus. So he is an intriguing storyline. Hanley, right there's now, a lot that's of my answer. And all the young guys, the killer bees, Ben and Tendi, does, yeah. he, does he break out this year? So, you know, an intriguing set of circumstances for the Sox. And they opened, thank God, for the first time since I've been here at Fenway. That's right, I couldn't, I couldn't Monday I versus, forgot. versus it Pittsburgh, which happens. is random. So uh, it's probably going to be freezing cold and raining, but we'll have to ask uh, Tony about that. All right, back to hockey now in Tuca. Much maligned. He didn't play against Ottawa. He was sick. Was it Ottawa? Uh, no, he didn't play against the Islanders. The he Islanders, had a lower which body they won. Injury. Which they won. Uh, going back to last year when he sits out the last game and they missed the playoffs. He's been hurt to his credit, but you worried about Tuca? Hudobin looked pretty good the other day. Dare I say, time to bench him? I think it is time to bench him. Wow. I'm sick of. Now, listen, he's a talented goalie. I've compared him to Clay Buckholz with pads. I just think <laughs> at this point, I'm done with the mental weakness. He's not there for a big game. Again, we saw it at the end of last year. A win or go home game for the Bruins. That was it. One game to get into the playoffs, and he wasn't there. He had a stomach bug. Now, uh, I, was, uh, I was out last night. My sister-in-law, actually a nurse at Mass General Hospital, uh, got on me because if you have a stomach bug, that is a debilitating thing. And, you know, you can't play a hockey game, let alone defend pucks and be a goalie. With right. a, but I didn't care because this is a stomach bug. I thought that we're going way back here. I didn't like it. Find a way to get on the ice in a must-win game. Pepto Bismol, yeah. whatever you have to do. So I didn't like that. Then he misses this game, which was as close to a must-win as you could get for a lower body injury. He practiced the day before, and then or he had a maintenance day. It was you know day to day, and now he's going to be back at practice today and on Monday, and he's expected to play this week. I didn't like how he missed the game. I'm sick of the mental weakness. I want to see a guy who's going to be in there. Four must-win game. He's going to be between the pipes. And, oh, by the way, Anton Kudobin, 5-0 and with Bruce Cassidy at the helm. He's hot. I would ride him for a little bit and see where we go. I'm not saying get rid of Tuka Rask, yeah. cut Tuka, but I'd ride Kudobin. I don't think you bench Tuka. I think you ride Hudobin for a game or two. And I think something the Bruins have done poorly is not coming to the defense of Tuka. Even if they think management that he should be playing, you got to put it out to the media, PR wise. He couldn't go. He was hugging a toilet, you know. Because I feel like every time he misses a game, it's kind of like, oh, you know, he's dealing, you know, how hockey injuries, upper body, lower body, he's not feeling right, he's managed, has a maintenance day. Like, what does that garbage mean? Yeah. Like, protect him, tell us what's going on so that we don't sit here and say he's not tough. The most important position on the team, like you said, you need leadership, you need someone a la Michael Jordan in the finals to go out there hunched over and be willing to play. But I don't think you dump on him because uh, Hudobin, all right, you said 5-0 and under Cassidy. Do we think he has a track record to, to lead this team he into the playoffs? He was brutal early in the season, I understand. But he's hot now. And I just can't stand the mental weakness that I, he I'd exhibits. I'd agree with that. Rask. If Hudobin keeps winning and it kind of nudges Tuca and he Back starts have, hearing some whispers. Well, just let me that, ask you this. Now, he's not the star player necessarily, but he's one of their top players. Right. Could you imagine... Just could you imagine Tom Brady or Dustin Pedroia in a must-win game no. with a stomach bug? You find a way. You no. find a way. I mean, to get Brady on the, played uh, his second season with like a torn rotator. You cover. find a By way. Way. This is the creepiest Tuka Rash shot of all time. It's so creepy. It looks like creepy. like a fifth grade no, elementary creepy. school picture. It's definitely <laughs> creepy. But you find a way to get on the ice in that game. That rattled me so much that, that time he did that. And then, of course, just doing it again in a, in a game that's essentially a must win with a lower and, and maintenance Cassidy day. And Cassidy called him out last week. And he I said he has to be better. That. Yeah, I appreciate it, too, especially for a guy with an interim tag on it. It just didn't look good. And I, uh, I would go with Kudobin for now. Um, okay, so... That's the hockey playoffs upcoming. The 
football playoffs a long way away. There is an AFC coaches breakfast that Bill Belichick, this man, will not be attending this week. Which is great. But, and we love the breakfast that he always goes to. But the question is, um, there's some rules that are being proposed in and around the NFL. One of them is, should coaches be able to challenge penalties? Now, this could happen. How do you feel about that? Absolutely not. The game is already bogged down by penalties and looking into the hood for what is a catch, what isn't a catch, one foot in. Other, traditional penalties like holding or subjective calls, everyone is essentially holding on every play. Uh, the you know Holding a receiver past five yards, all that is so subjective that isn't every coach just going to throw the flag whenever a play doesn't go their way? And, oh, take a look at the left tackle. He might have been holding. Okay. No. It, listen, Roger Goodell said this week we're going to speed up the game by eliminating a couple of uh, kickoff timeouts or what have you. I think this would just slow it down. There's enough with the flags already. And uh, speaking of Belichick, I think he takes pride in not challenging. And didn't he lead the league in fewest amount of challenges last year? I'm not aware of that stat. Um, he, we know he keeps him in the sock, but... Yeah, no, this is just bog it down. I, you, this is new to me. You just told me this when we got in, so I don't even know about the rule. But uh, I also thought it was interesting today when uh, someone in the NFL said, or an owner said, uh, someone proposed a rule that has a better chance of getting done because the Patriots didn't propose it. I just thought that was an interesting dynamic, but off topic. Um, I hear what you're saying. Nobody wants a slower game. I appreciate calls being correct. Um, so my solution would be this. The only penalty that you make challengeable mm -hmm. is pass interference because that penalty could be a 40, 50, 60 yard game changing penalty. And you say it's, everything's subjective. As you said, holding, that would get ridiculous. You couldn't do that on every play, even though some holding calls are huge. But the pass interference, where it can completely change the complexion of the game, right. field position, and you know, they are subjective too. But a lot of times when you slow it down and see the replay of pass yeah. interference, you can tell. Right. He didn't look back. He didn't right. touch him. He, I would accept that. Overall, every call, uh, and mainly holding, would be the big one, and especially some of the ones near the line of scrimmage. Mm -hmm. Those are the ones that really get tough. But anything that's called pass interference, yeah. I would allow that to be challenged. Yeah, I mean, that is the unique circumstance, the deep pass interference call. But, you know. A lot. The Baltimore Ravens. How many times does Flacco just go deep and they get a PI call? Well, that's what and it's I'm 40, It's forty. So yards. at least make sure that it's PI. So I would allow that. But it would have to. You'd only get so many challenges. It would be right. under the challenging umbrella. So under the challenge umbrella. Uh, let's talk about NCAA basketball. We have our final four. We have North Carolina, Oregon, Gonzaga, and South Carolina. I have. God, I guess I have zero Final Four teams. How, how's your bracket I have looking? one. I had Gonzaga. You had Gonzaga. So not a ton of upsets in the early rounds. Some great mat like the Kentucky UNC Blue Bloods yesterday. I thought that was great. What would you make of the tournament so far, and how's your bracket looking? Bracket's not good. Bracket is in the trash. I mean, it, no one had South Carolina, no, right? No, no, no. I had Duke winning it all. Um, so that went, that went down fast and hard. Um, bracket does not look good, but the tournament has been okay. For me... I'm not a big fan of South Carolina being in the Final Four. Football schools. They don't do much for me. I have to listen to all the SEC honks that I worked with and on Twitter. I don't really care about that. Um, they, don't really, there's, they don't create any sizzle for me. I don't really care to see South Carolina in the Final Four. It's a nice story, but I don't care. Um, I wish the Kentucky-North Carolina game was a Final Four was game or a title four. game yeah. or something like that, but it isn't. A great game, though. The Florida... Uh, game where they eliminated Wisconsin was a great game. I was oh, watching that one live. I couldn't believe when he hit that I runner that. from a million feet. Um, but it's a good. I mean, the tournament has been okay. Um, it's been just okay. And for, it hasn't it's been, been great. okay. And from a local perspective, I didn't know if we could have done a whole topic on this, but seeing Oregon in the Final Four and then thinking about URI makes me cringe because Hassan Martin could not play in that game, mm. and if he gave them anything, they win that game. Right. No question, they right. win. Um, well, I know it's all Scott, about matchups. You're like, all right, if they beat Oregon, would they have necessarily gone on to beat Kansas? Right. By no, the way? I know. Who knows? But, yeah, I mean, URI was right there. She probably should have beat Oregon. Now they're in the Final Four. In terms of who I'm rooting for, I think the Gonzaga story is intriguing yes. because they were always the underdog, you know, the little engine that could. And then they became such a good program that they're now a one seed. So it would be cool to see them see it through, so to speak, and win it all. That UNC-Kentucky game was great. Listen, Calipari has to start getting some heat for underachieving. I mean, he has the best teams every year, and he's won sure. one title. A couple vacated final, whether a Memphis one and a UMass one, yeah. I think, have been vacated. 
Um, what are they going to do? Fire John Calipari? No, no. But if you look at how do you apply, he's heat? got a little bit of a 1990s Atlanta Braves thing going for him. Like right there every year at the top. But think about but it. Not, which coaches are really winning multiple championships? Coach how many K. has Roy Williams won? He's there every year too. They don't Roy win all the time. Roy has two, two, I believe. Right, he's got two. K's got five. K is self, self underachieving too. Self. Self's got one. Yeah, I mean Kansas has one. Kansas has the Mario Chalmers one. I can't think of another one. Yeah, I, I'm um, just trying to think of coaches that win it here. There's no Bill yeah. Belichick in college basketball other than Coach K, who's been doing it since about 90, 1990. So earlier, I think 80. He's he been around. Right. He's been around. So it's tough to say. I know Calipari should have won more. Rick Pitino has what two? The I mean, that's two. Patino has one Kentucky, one Louisville. Yeah. The issue with March Madness and NCAA tournament in general is you're so late to the party, you start really paying attention so late. It's like Lonzo Ball sweeps the nation mainly because of his dad, and then you get to see him play for a handful of games. Mm. I was lucky enough to see him in person because they were in the UI region, and then he's gone. Gone. You know, it's like, all right, Lonzo Ball was in our life for a month, and that was fun, but like, we're so bogged down with the NFL and locally URI and PC that we're not. I wouldn't say I'm a huge national college basketball fan until it's almost too late. You know what I mean? Yeah, there's too many other things. All right. Um, okay, lastly here. So Tom Brady, um, was it Monday, I think, he enjoyed a round of golf at you know, Augusta National with Jordan Spieth and a couple other Under Armour executives. Kevin Plank. Kevin Plank, guy. the owner uh, and founder of Under Armour. So that got us to think, and we've talked about this before in the office, what would be your dream celebrity foursome? All right. I've been thinking about it, and I have my four. Okay. Well, it'd be three other people. You three and three people. people. I have Belichick and Brady. Hold Belichick on. and Brady. And Brady. Now, understanding we're drinking beers here, okay. so everyone's going to get a little loose, talk about stories off the record. Belichick and Brady, because I want them... I want to see their dynamic together, and I want to see them. Do you remember this? I want that dynamic, reliving the, the dynasty. I have Tiger Woods because I want to play. Now, this is Tiger Woods playing good golf, not, you know, bum knee Tiger Woods. You know, the greatest golfer ever, potentially hitting shots, telling stories about golf and his philandering and other things. And then someone to kind of make the mood a little light and bring some levity to it all and be funny. So I'm just going to bring Will Ferrell in there. So I got me, Belichick, Brady, and Tiger Woods. Oh, shoot. I said four people, so I'm five now with myself, right? You said four. Yeah. Um, All right, so I'm subbing out Belichick. So I got Brady, Tiger Woods, and Will Ferrell. Okay. Um, Belichick, Tiger Woods, and Will Ferrell. Yeah. No, Brady. Oh, Brady. Who'd you get rid of? Belichick's can now because I I, I forgot to include myself. Okay. Okay. I didn't spend enough time thinking about this, unfortunately. <laughs> my first inclination would be Ken Griffey Jr. I've never met him. Yeah. He was my favorite. He's a good golfer. Let's get Griffey Jr. in there. You think the swing is as majestic as his baseball Probably. swing? Probably. Definitely. Um, yeah, you could go. I mean, normally, under normal circumstances, I would put the president of the United States into this, but. Trump? What the hell? I'll put the president of the United States into this. I think it would be funny, not that I support this president um, the way. It, well, let's not go down that road. I support the president, but I didn't vote for this man. But anyway, I would put the president into All this right. mix because he'd be entertaining. So um, Griffey Jr. Now, in, Trump is regarded as a pretty big cheater, though. There's people okay, who I can handle document. It. I'll handle You'll it. handle that. Are you yeah. going to call him out? Uh, I'll see how it goes. Um, <laughs> kind of kicks it out of the out of bounds. and uh, Yeah, we'll see how it goes. Um, and then my last person... May I, you know, I, I could go. Uh, you do like your dad or like a family member. No, no, it's member. a celebrity. It's oh, a celebrity. celebrity. Right, right, right. I'm right. trying. I'm torn between either either somebody that would lighten the mood, like Tommy Lee, or Tommy Lee. I just think it'd be funny. He'd be funny. And is uh, Cam Anderson in tow, or is he solo? No, he'd be solo. Or Rory McIlroy. I think I go with Rory McIlroy. The only reason Rory is because Rory seems like he's a cool dude. Yeah, and he's my size, my weight, my height. So that would be funny to watch, kind of him crush the ball. Yeah. At the same physical stature, and, and me and, just and my force would along. be funny. Tiger and Brady just comparing like greatest Greatness, of all time yeah. stories. Belichick like, could be interesting, but I'm, I have reservations about how much he'd really open up. How much up. fun? Even yeah. he'd be drinking. I, I could. I, I just. I mean, if I like, could control. In an ideal his, world, the, the Belichick is retired and willing to talk. You know, the the Tiger Woods is at his best. You know what I mean? You know, I don't want to play with Tiger if he's shooting an 88. I want, like, 68 Tiger. Yeah, I want to see. You want to marvel at some of his shots. And like, do you, 
I like Rory over Spieth. Spieth, I don't know how much fun Spieth would be. He's probably a cool dude. I'm Rory, sure I feel like, would yeah, not Rory, back a and few. Rory's got stories. He's got tales oh, yeah, to tell, yeah. I bet. So, but and maybe, you could get the Tiger stories out of Rory. Maybe my it's just because I want to see him, a guy my size, yeah. hit the ball so far and just do things that I couldn't dream of doing with the golf ball. So I just like to see that. And Griffey, it'd be fun. He's kind of a stiff, though. I don't know. I wish I had more time with him. Um, do you have a name yet for your boy or girl? We have, we're more um, not well, – we have our boy name, I think. The girl name, we don't know. We already used one, so – you guys gonna we like, to like well, flip Maeve a coin was born. or we something? Didn't even have, we didn't have a uh, name when she was born. We when the nurse asks you, like hands you the baby for the first time and says, "What's his or her name?" You make it. We don't know. T- I'll TBD. Say we're Sta- you're gonna say stand by. Am I TV obligated term? to the nurse to tell no, her the name? No. no. I just remember pretty quickly, recently, then with Chip, then being like, "What's his name?" I'll I'll ask Jen again. Jen, what's what are we doing here? Oh, oh yeah, George. All right, it's George. Well, well, no, no, no. I'll talk to her before actually delivering. But then she's in pain because she's in labor, so I have to do it before then. Yeah. On the I way can't into the wait hospital. for you to sleep on those awful yeah, couch I, well, I've been there, yeah. uh, chair things. Those yeah. things are the worst. Yeah. I think I would pay a significant amount of money to have like a bed, an additional bed. That's about as bad as sleep as you'll get, but you know, it's for good reason. Yeah. All um, right, good luck, pal. Thank you. <laughs> That'll do it for the latest episode of Double OT. Catch it every week on WPRI.com and download it on iTunes. See you next time.